Dream, the 2nd of December, 2020. He died again yesterday. The same vague but violent death as in other dreams. Perhaps some freak accident. Perhaps a terrible crime. Either way, he died. And you and your friends were all there when I found out. The TV spoke of it as we gathered round. I felt back tears with each gruesome detail. I couldn't appear any more affected than one ought to be when a distant acquaintance dies, dies young and in pain. I couldn't let any of you see, couldn't let my breath catch, couldn't scream, only stand there as the edges of my world turned blurry, the screen disappearing in a bluish halo. Once the TV was off, of course, it was all anyone wanted to talk about. They discussed it with great poise, a mild nuance of pity, as though it was something sad, yes, but not unexpected, as though, in quiet agreement, they had decided that he was only half forgiven and therefore deserved only half a mourning. We formed a circle round a girl with insider info, you to my right and all eyes on her. I listened, mortified but eager. I hated all those images that scarred themselves into my brain. Still, I needed to know. I needed to hold on to any shards of him. To know so I could see it, feel it, be there in hindsight. She spoke of him, of how he had suffered how he had been taken to the hospital, barely conscious, and died there, alone in the main hall. I gasped then. I buckled. He didn't die on the spot. He wasn't even given that small mercy. At first, I had dabbed quietly the corners of my eyes, displaying the appropriate degree of grief. But now, now I wept, letting you hold me, you who knew nothing for so long. Suddenly, I couldn't care that you would understand, that I was losing face, breaking character. Everything was broken anyway. After a long beat, you offered that the whole party relocate to your place, and you led me outside up the stony steps of the steep street. I realized belatedly that I was barefoot, but I said nothing. I didn't ask for us to turn back so I could get my shoes. It seemed to make sense. Walking, flesh on concrete, up those long flights of stairs, like crawling on your knees on your way to penance. Once in your house, you told the others to settle on the couch, now playing your part in keeping appearances, continuing my life's work, keeping the storylines separate. You took me to a small guest room, all white and blue. You sat with me on the bed and you didn't ask, didn't make me confess. You acted like I had told you already. When you spoke, it was only to say, you had seen my silent struggle during the news broadcast, that it hit home the second I had collapsed in your arms. And so I described that same scene from my point of view. We didn't look at each other. I spoke with my eyes on your nape and a palm on your back. I asked, do you know why I never told you? And I explained. I explained with a little girl's voice. All my reasonings that sounded so small now. You touched my hand and you walked out, letting another boy in, a stranger with a kind face. Maybe because some things simply can't be said to friends. He sat and poured puzzle pieces on the bedspread. Plastic shapes and triangles meant to fit together in a neat and mysterious order, like a Chinese tangram. As I recounted the whole story from the very start, 
His fingers kept moving, trying, failing to make anything stick. It began as such a cliché. Me, a brainy and high-strung wallflower. Him, popular to the point of collective loathing. A cliché, but still, it wasn't some dumb crush. It was ten years ago. The worst thing of all is that lately, we'd started talking more and more. He had changed. He was kinder. It was toneless and disjointed. But still, it was a child's pleading, clinging to the mad thought that I could appeal and have it be undone. Because it wasn't fair. My throat narrowed, and again, all the pieces collapsed. Nothing would ever be made whole again.